All right, I think we're on. Guys, welcome to a very impromptu uh, new episode of High Stakes PLO Podcast. I am Joey Ramon. We are joined by the fan favorite, the one of the most popular guests all time on my podcast, all couple people I've talked to so far. Uh, we have Sean LaFort back. What's up, buddy? I take pride in having that title. That's that's uh, You've had some interesting people, so I'm glad that people enjoyed our podcast together. I, they very much enjoyed it. I mean, there's been you know great feedback in the, in the 2 plus 2 thread that, that I have in NVG about my podcast, uh, also in the High Stakes PLO. I've gotten a ton of messages on Facebook and, and on Twitter and on Skype, people saying they really enjoyed the episode, and they had no idea who you were. They're now a fan of yours. And it's awesome. Good stuff. Yeah, I, th I thought it was pretty great. And obviously, I just messaged you a couple uh, a little earlier this morning. I'm like, hey, do you want to just record a random podcast together for people to listen to? We're gonna try to keep this one about 45 minutes. That way, more people can listen to it. And you decide, you you know, you're uh, you're not eating. You're not going to the bathroom right now. You're not working out. You're not. We had a perfect time actually, because it's like it's 10:30 a.m. here, and it's absolutely gorgeous in Toronto, and it has been all. It's like the first week here where summer is really starting. Uh -huh. And all my friends were like gearing up for like a pool party this afternoon and stuff. So it caught me at the perfect time to just kind of shoot off some uh, some podcast material before going to have fun. So that'd be fun. So are you going? You said you're going to a, a pool party today? Yeah, honestly, it's the craziest thing. So my uh, two of my friends moved into this brand new building um, right downtown, and they <laughs> they have this pool party or this pool located on like the 20th floor. It's like a 50 story building, and it's like Basically, it's, you know, outside, obviously, mm. and there's room for, like, 100-plus people, and there's, like, all these cabanas and a, a pool, and basically everybody just gets absolutely annihilated. It's just a bunch of, like, 22 to, like, 29-year-olds, and everybody's everybody's out there getting smashed, and uh, it's a recipe for disaster, though. They're, like, there's, there's a railing where, like, if somebody was drunk, they could fall off, and they're just gonna fall 20 stories to their death like last last week when we were there people were super slamming each other like body slamming each other into the pool where there's like a ledge like and and people are like it's like basically it's like a Las Vegas pool party without any sophistication whatsoever so it's and it's in a, a building that has you know thousands of residents or I guess you know tons of residents so we had a massive um, noise complaint last week, and my buddy almost got into a fight with the security guard because he's just really confrontational. It was hilarious. Like it, this place is a lot of fun, but it's not going to last for long because something bad is going to happen. I think, but so, but for now it's a lot of fun. Would you say there's some raging going on at this place? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's just like a rage fest at a pool, basically. There hookers, drugs, you know, there's all kinds of that. I don't know about drugs, but there maybe maybe behind the scenes, you know, like behind the the plant. The decorative plants. There's drugs or something going on, maybe. Well, I spent some time at some of these, um, you know, pool type of similar type of parties in Vancouver. Maybe not quite as extravagant as the ones you're describing, but and there was a very common denominator at all these parties. You know, the hookers, drugs. But you know, yeah, you know, it's like a standard. It's not. They weren't anything poker related, but they somehow they browsed two plus two, and they realized that everyone in two plus two really was obsessed with hookers, drugs, and blow. So they knew I was coming. They just decided to have some of that all there just for me because I read it for you. Um, you know, it was it was very nice of them to actually do that for me. I'm, I'm That's funny. I mean, Vancouver is kind of like that because it, it tends to be a hub for a lot of drugs coming in yeah. and stuff, right? So it's a little more laid back as well. So you have a lot more people there that are inclined to be in that lifestyle. Toronto is a little more like. It's a little more um, New York City-ish in that it's, like, faster paced, a lot of, like, super hard workers. So, I mean, I don't do it, but I assume from, I mean, from what I know, the drug of choice here is basically just people doing coke, going to the clubs and bars and stuff. But you don't see a whole lot of people smoking weed or doing acid or anything crazy like that here. It's a lot of, like, hardcore, let's get super high for the club so that we dance our faces off. I'm sure there's... A lot of E and M and stuff like that, but did you just did you just call weed hardcore? No, sorry. I, I yeah, I realized as soon as I said that. Oh, I believe you now. You said you I, I, meant, I, I, I meant to set like put a comma there and then a separator. Um, okay. uh, 
this is a, so we're going to record this for a PLO podcast episode. I'm doing, a, for anyone who doesn't know, my podcasts are on iTunes. I'll put a link in the description, or you can search Chicago Joey, one word. All my podcasts, my PLO, Power Poker, Poker Life, they're all going to be on there. And, um, you know, I was going to record a episode, a new PLO episode with uh, Isildrun, and we're going to live stream that. It's, it'll be probably a little bit longer version, but... You know, I just, like, I just, I don't know, I'm so excited to get you back on the podcast, man. The, ask, ask, uh, ask Isildrun what the, what the origin of his name is. I'm just curious. Like, I, I assume it has something to do with Isildur, but, like, what well, is the... I always called him Isildur 2, and I just assumed he was, like, one, when he first came around, I just assumed he was, like, uh, you know, Isildur was his hero, and he wanted to be, like, Isildur, so he made his name Isildrun. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing, yeah. but I just always wanted to know. Well, we will we will definitely ask him. You know, it's gonna be interesting. I've never I haven't spoke to a Northern European person for besides like Skype. For I, I don't think I ever really have. So we'll probably you know we'll have a nice discussion. We'll learn more about him. We'll learn about Swedish women and cool. Although I don't know how uh, well versed Isildrun is into the Swedish women population. Maybe he's gonna let us know. Hopefully, we'll see. Hopefully, he's not shy and reserved like a kid like you is. Uh, kid like you is so. It's tough when you, like, yeah. Like, I mean, if it's, like, a poker player that, like, logs a lot of time playing online, you have to assume that they're not, like, super social, right? But they can be. Yeah. But, I mean, the average person, you know. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. But I guess with with, with someone like Isildrun, you know, I don't know, because I've talked, you know, I, I talk to him occasionally, and I know a bit about him, but just like most other people in PLO right now, I don't know super a lot about him besides, you know, makes training videos and plays right. like a fucking psychopath. Preflop, but he's a very big knit on the on the river. So I sorry, I might have told people that I'm sorry, little and I just might have given like, a secret about you. But yeah, <laughs> I'm really excited to learn more about him and um, have uh, people out there learn more. I mean, he seems to be a pretty popular guy in the, uh, in the in the PLO world too for the yeah. over in Europe. So I'm excited to have him on. Cool. I don't have any topics, kid. <laughs> You know, I, I want to be a PO episode. I don't have any hands picked out. I don't have any topics. Um, I know okay. some topics. I actually, I'm, we're going to talk about. If anyone has any questions, I'm, we are live streaming this right now on my YouTube channel. Um, if anybody wants to know anything, ask any questions. Go ahead, feel free to ask. Um, mm-hmm. We're going to talk about so, so your blog. So, so you write. Yeah. You've started writing a fitness blog. You've written three entries right now. I actually just uh, read your your latest entry, which is how to put on some some muscle size uh, a couple days ago. I've already incorporated. Four of the ideas into my into my regimen so far, which you know um, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm taking I'm trying to take it pretty seriously. Yeah. But you know, what's the feedback been? I feel like I've seen a lot of comments on Twitter, people commenting on the stuff you've been writing. Just uh, yeah, like, how's it been going? It's it's been good. Um, the the thing is, and I kind of predicted this would happen. Um, like the first the fir- first blog entry had like you know however many views, and then the next one had like more, and then this one I was like, okay, great, like. This is, you know, I'm dropping a ton of knowledge with this one. It's like a 9,000 word thing. It's going to have, you know, I was really hoping that it was going to be huge, but it's kind of like had the same attention as the last one. And I think a lot of it is just that it's just so long. I feel like it's going to take a while before people get around to actually caring enough to read about it. Um, but I, I kind of debated like whether I wanted to make it so extensive and so long and technical, but... I mean, the thing is, is like, and this is kind of something, the fact that it's long is a reflection of just how difficult it is to achieve the, the, the goal of, like, putting on some muscle. Because that that's that's kind of, like, a big lesson that a lot of people haven't learned. And it's kind of similar to poker, actually. Like, if you ask me to discuss a poker hand, a lot of times it may, may seem similar, but I or it may seem simple, but I can go on for an hour discussing it. Like, poker is very complex, so is the human body. So when it comes to being a good poker player or, you know, doing something changing the human body, these are very complex things. So it makes sense that my, my article was so long. Um, it doesn't have any secret how to, you know, quickly put on a few pounds or how to, how to do this magically. Like, that's just the whole theme of the article is that that doesn't exist. As much as supplement companies are going to try to feed you some powder that's going to, you know, make you blow up and look like you should be on a magazine, that's just not the way it works. So that's kind of the theme of the article is, um, you know, maybe disproving a few of those things and kind of introducing some, some principles that people should be um, thinking about if they're actually trying to, to do something like build muscles. So I apologize for how long it is, and I realize that because it's so long, 
you know, it's probably not going to get uh, a ton of immediate attention from from people. But I hope that over the long run, it becomes something that um, people kind of uh, harken back to as like a really good source of information. Like, it's funny, my my run at once videos have been um, have had the exact same type of response. Like when I was making them, I put a lot of time into them, put a lot of hours, and I was actually a little disappointed by how um, it didn't. They didn't get a lot of. Um, they they like they definitely got some love, but they didn't get as much love as I was hoping for. And it wasn't until now that like I made them a year or two ago that I have all sorts of like really good players every once in a while send me a message or a text and be like, "Yo, I just watched your video and it's like fucking amazing." So it's like it took a while for it to kind of like for them to gain some appreciation. I feel like this blog entry will probably do the same. I think with. Your, you know, I, I, I don't play any No Limit. I haven't played in years. And I remember I came across a video of yours, and I was just listening when I was going to bed. I always wanted to try something. I was like, all right, you know, I, I you know, heard, I've heard, seen you have pretty good results at both games. So I'm like, let me just check out the Le Fort video. And that's how I, that was my impression. I was like, wow, this is, I, I feel like this is, he's talking about No Limit, but a lot of the same ideas, concepts that you're talking about do carry over quite well to poker in general. So. Right. That's when I first, you know, even really found out a bit about who you were. I didn't really know much else about you, but I agree that same, that video was, you know, the videos that you put out are pretty good. And I, I understand why, like you said, they have that type of effect where at first, at first, because they are, they are overwhelming. You know, you're, you put a lot of knowledge out there just like with these workout things. So with the latest thing, the one that I specifically read, which I think I may have asked you about, like, hey, when are you going to write this? And you're like, it's really long. So I'm like, okay, I'm excited. <laughs> And you've kind of shared some ideas. I've asked you some questions because, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, st I'm already in pretty good shape, but I I'd like to put on some more size. My biggest thing I don't, I, I don't eat. But in addition to that, I think there's a lot of other small things I could be doing, which, sure. you know, you touched on in your, in, your, um, in your writing, like drinking a lot more water, always drinking water, having the protein shake directly after my, my gym session right away instead of going home 30, 45 minutes, as you stated, you know, we waste some time and you don't have it. And I don't want this to turn into a total workout podcast, but, you know, I think that over time when, you know, I'd like to try to help get that message out there that, hey, like, here's a really great, great source of knowledge who's also a poker player, and if you have any questions, he's more than happy to, you know, talk to you about things and stuff like that. And But like you said, it is pretty long, and the ways to maybe maybe fix that or split it up into parts, maybe put some of it into video content, something like that. You know, and you know, just put give more pe give people um, more of an opportunity to want to tune in. So instead of reading, you know, forty five minutes, they can read fifteen minutes, ten minutes at a time, or they can watch a ten minute, fifteen minute video too. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, that's kind of the plan for the future. Now that I've kind of laid out those blogs on the more general topics, is that now I can kind of target more specific stuff, and I I suspect a lot of it will come from readers who have, you know, extended questions on these articles, um, and then I can kind of tackle those. And that's that's really my goal of the, the blog, is to make it highly interactive. Because I want to... A big thing, like, making videos and coaching poker have been two of the things that have really made my poker game progress. Because until you can be very good at teaching somebody something, then you're not actually an expert at that something, in my opinion. Like, in order to fully understand something, it's when you get to that level where you can actually teach somebody else about it. So, um, I, and from a selfish standpoint, I look forward to learning a lot from other people about the blog, which I, I already have. Like, I had people point out a few of my mistakes, few of my mistakes in one of the other articles, and it's been great because I kind of like it opened my eyes to a few things, and I actually watched a documentary of my own um, that I had never seen before. It, uh, it was called Fathead. It was pretty interesting. Um, it was basically countering the whole the Super Size Me guy who like blew up and gained 50 pounds because he ate McDonald's. It's like the reverse, saying that like you can eat just McDonald's but actually be at a caloric um, deficit and actually lose weight and, and not necessarily be like crazy healthy or unhealthy. So it was it was interesting. It was just kind of like it, it uh, foiled a few of the the myths about um, saturated fats, I guess. Well, I know it's one thing that you're, you're really good at, and that's, I feel like I'm also good at that is, you know, in your blogs, if you make a mistake or if you say something and then you later 
shown or proven that that might not be the case, you're you're not you're willing to say that. You're willing to be like, hey, you know, I wasn't right. Like, I don't need to always be right. Like, yeah. I'm learning just like you're learning. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people have that problem where they they feel like everything they say or think is the correct thing or the correct way to do things. And then when someone yeah. gives them feedback, instead of taking it in and thinking about it, they just immediately put it to the side and say, fuck that, I'm, I'm right, they're wrong, you know. Yeah, that's no, for, for sure. I think that's, like, such an incredibly um, important skill to get good at anything, really. I mean, like, when you look at the best people in any area, whether it's a sport or, um, you know, finance or poker, or anything, like, you know, that there's a competitive field, you know, the, when, when the, the best players are interviewed, like, it's so obvious that they're always still students of their 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 art and their passion and their, their game. Um, they're just constantly learning, you know, and that's, like, that's why they get to be where they are because they're constantly absorbing information and correcting themselves and, and improving themselves. I think, I think a lot of poker players tend to get um, stuck on being... Uh, being like, because the thing, the thing is, is that you do need a lot of. Um, I guess confidence is the is not quite the word I'm looking for, but you need conviction with your strategies in poker. So you have to have, you have to be confident in your way that your strategies are good. So you always want to be able to defend yourself against people when you're talking about, you know, poker strategy and stuff. So I think a lot of poker players though kind of adopt that attitude that, you know, they've gotten to a point where they've made a lot of money, so they're pretty much always right, and just because this guy plays mid-stakes, says this thing in a video, he must be wrong because, you know, oh, I could crush him heads up or whatever, but, like, there's always something to be learned from everyone, you know? I mean, I completely agree. I think one of the big turning points for me was when I was able to realize that, or, you know, I'm not even sure what happened. I think, I think it was when I was thinking about better ways to make friends because I was always like when I when I was really obsessed I played poker all the time for like three or four years straight like I really didn't do much else I had I had the idea that everyone outside of poker was like not worth my time or not not maybe not worth my time just people that I wouldn't be interested in being friends with because I was so obsessed with poker so outside right. of women you know hanging out with the women going on a date or you know maybe dating her a couple times I really wasn't open to the idea that other people out there could have any sort of positive effect on my life and you know, that made me come off as a huge asshole to a lot of people. And when someone pointed that out to me one time, we were on a trip in, uh, in Spain, and the group we were with, they're like, you know, you're a really big asshole sometimes. And I was like, thinking about it, I was like, I'm not, I'm pretty, I don't think I'm an asshole at all. But then I started thinking about it, and I was like, wow, I really am super close minded about a lot of things. And that was, I think, was a big turning point. And it also helped me with poker. I just, my, I was like, all right, well, I need to figure out how to make friends. I need to figure out, you know, how to not be an asshole. And, and going up, that's that's one of the things you figure out, you know, taking in criticism, feedback, good and bad, you know, even I mean, not criticism, maybe just someone saying something mean to you, but still right. taking that in, not necessarily, you know, getting that emotionally hurt about it, but figuring out a way. Well, maybe they're right. Let's, I mean, maybe I can improve myself for the better here. So, yeah, for sure. And I think that a lot that relates to poker a lot is that we can always be getting better, improving, and taking advice from all kind of areas of. Oh yeah, poker spectrum here. Absolutely, especially um, when you just kind of look back at the evolution of the game. I mean, the guys who were the best in 2007 were making a ton of money. So, like, to be that guy, whoever it was, that was making all like one of those guys making all the money. Whoever you know, there's a list of names we could list, but for you know, th that's irrelevant. But the point is that any one of them could have said. Um, okay, well, I'm making all the money, I'm always right, clearly, I'm making, you know, so much money playing poker, so why would I work on my game? But now, fast forward five, six, seven years, if you were to take their strategies, I mean, they'd be getting crushed at, like, one, two, no limit, you know? So, like, it's very obvious that it's an important skill to be critical of yourself, especially in a highly dynamic environment like poker is. Poker's, it, it, you don't notice it if you're involved in the community because... You're playing every day. You're on the forums every day. But if you actually look back, you know, just a year, two years, and really specifically look at things strategy-wise, the games, everything, things change a lot. And uh, I think you need to have an appreciation for that and always be looking to, you know, 
keep up with things because it's easy to let the games pass you by for sure. I feel like we're giving out too much strategy. I know you like giving out strategy. I feel like we're we're gonna be giving out a lot of, living a lot of like strategy when you really take it in and think about it. It actually could benefit you in a way. And obviously, you know, not everyone's necessarily the best at taking things in and applying it to to themselves, but those people that are, and they, li- they they listen to some of the things. I mean, they might go back and listen to the three-hour podcast we already recorded where, you know, I've even kind of re-listened to some of that because I just thought there's some good knowledge in there, you know, as far as there's a really good discussion, and I thought it was one of the better poker podcasts. Obviously, I'm biased. You're biased, too. We're both in it. Of course, we think it's one of the best poker podcasts, but, you know, that's kind of feedback I've gotten so far from a lot of people is they really enjoyed that conversation, so... I actually had a buddy or two message me since then and be like, yo, bro, don't be giving away free information. <laughs> I guess they didn't like that I gave away a little too much strategy. So, But I should probably, yeah, I mean, I don't want to be giving away free strategy information, but on the other, there's a fine line. You want to make it interesting, and, you know, I want the viewers to, I don't want to, I don't want to just troll every hand that we talk about because because I'm, I'm in some elitist poker player that, you know, thinks... You know, I don't want any, I'm, I'm better than everybody. I don't want every, anybody else to get good. There's a lot of that that goes on, you know. Yeah. You know, and I think that that general attitude is a very short-term way to look at things, you know. But, yeah. Obviously, it's something I've, I've thought about. I've wrote, written about on my blog. I've talked about on the forums the idea of training sites, giving away strategy. Where's the line? Where's the balance? You know, and they're just... At this point, with my stuff I'm doing now, I try not to get too in depth into strategy, and that seems to be going okay for right now. But I can see a point where I decide that I'm a bit more lax, I guess, on talking some strategy. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's always it's it's a. I'm also on an upswing, so you know, obviously you know feel good. I'm on a. I got the podcast run good. I think people. I, I think we um, we had someone calculate this and in, do a program, but people that listen to the podcast while playing poker are up $287,000. That's so sick. Who, yeah. who won the bulk of that? <laughs> I made that up. I don't fucking know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been tweeting that. I'm, I just, I mean, it sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, just... That's amazing. I wish you hadn't told me that. You should have made something up. <laughs> Why should you have said you won it all? How much you up, kid? Something like that. Yeah, we'll say we'll say that much. How much you up since the podcast run good? How much are you up? Uh, let's hear. Give me a number. Give me a. a, a is it between? Is it greater than a hundred thousand? I think since the podcast, I'm probably up around a hundred thousand. I think, maybe not that much. Somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand. It's very romantic, by the way, with the candle in the background. Well, you know, I appreciate that you. I yes, I I can kind of smell it. It's like cinnamon, I think. Well, that's weird. Can you smell? That's weird. I well, I bought one of those webcams that actually has a, a, a scent uh, tracked into it, so you can track a scent. So that's maybe the, what you're getting over there. See, I've always said, that, I'm going to go on a tangent here, but I've always said an awesome product would be some sort of like digital scent. Maker, if you could like somehow copy scents and release them through, um, you know, some sort of device, like how sick would it be to have it on shuffle and just wake up to like one of your top 100 favorite scents in the morning? You know, that's your alarm clock is just like, you know, some fresh cinnamon smell or some some outdoorsy, you know, whatever. Like, I think that'd be super cool. No, I love I mean, I have, like so many colognes and just like, I don't know, it's one of my favorite. Sense. I think it's my favorite scent. Smell. What? What's your favorite scent? Smell. Like, uh, oh, sense. Oh, sense in general. Do you have a, a go-to cologne? Like, let's say, okay, so let's say, for instance, you're in the mirror. You just got out of the shower. You, you know, you're you're wiping off with a towel. You look in the mirror. You're looking at your physique. You're happy. You know, you're 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 flexing a bit. You got your water, obviously, because you drink water constantly. You probably go to the bathroom because you go to the bathroom 145 times a day. But you look in the mirror. You get dressed. You're 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 excited about the date. You're going to dinner. You're gonna you know you're gonna drink some of your favorite wine. You know you're gonna eat one of your favorite steaks. But you know you want to smell a certain way. Now this is an important date. You really like this girl. You really want to impress her. What's your go-to scent? It really depends on my mood. But I think my see, like I wear them. I tend to wear them for. Um, 
like, selfish reasons because I like the smell. So, like, they are not necessarily <laughs> what the girl might like the most because I just don't care. But, like, um, I, I actually really like a Louis Vuitton one that I wear, like, a lot. So... You know, it must be it must be nice when you can get to the point in your life that you don't you don't care what they think what you smell like. You just want to smell good for yourself. You know, well, to smell good, right? Like, so my my point is that I I go with the one that's gonna like, you know, it make, it's gonna cheer you up, make you happy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting way to approach dating, my friend. You, mix, you ever mix colognes? I, tell me more. Yeah. I don't know. Have you mixed colognes? It's a gamble, but it can sometimes produce some pretty cool results. So, in, in a vacuum for the, the, the guys out there that might not be able to get away with wearing just any cologne to cheer them up, would you have a go-to type of set, uh, type of cologne you can recommend? Maybe Louis Vuitton? Is that what you should suggest? I think the key. It's funny that I'm actually like, like critiquing this seriously, but I think the key is that you want to come up with one that is not like the common go-to scent that every dude is wearing because that's, you're just going to remind her of the dude that she was just on a date on. Like, uh, because like the, the, oh, what's it called? You're going out with Sean? Wait, well, what kind of girls do you date? The girls I date only, um, they don't, they, they don't date much. They only date me because I'm special. What Must kind of girls? Date. The girls you date, dating other guys that same week or something? I'm, maybe not that week, but I'm sure they've been on dates with other dudes at some point over the last few months. But the idea is not to, to, to have something a little unique, I guess. I don't know. Like, a lot of guys have, like, a Boss Cologne and a, um, you know, like the, what's the, the there's the, what's the one that comes in the blue bottle with the, the jacked guy? And he's just kind of there. You know what I mean? The, uh, the, uh, Bod? No, it's, uh, it's French. It's like Gardin. No. Uh, anyways, it's like, they super pimp it out at, like, the department stores. Mm. And I just, I can... I can literally think of at least three of my friends that wear it regularly. So I just, like, don't want to be the fourth. <laughs> you I, know guess, what I guess I've never really been someone that's, that's um, when I've dated, and I didn't put too much cologne strat into my mind, but I should have. I, I, I've got to have a strong cologne game, bro. Got to have a strong cologne game. Well, I know one thing that you were talking about that makes you uh, stand out, and we can also talk about your plans coming up here over the next few weeks. You were telling me you were, you were just packing up your scarves because you wanted to be unique when you went to the World Series of Poker. <laughs> As we know, at, at, wait, at these tournaments, no one wears scarves, right? So that's why you're bringing yours? Or you wanted to stand out? or what? I'm confused. Wait. <laughs> I think, actually, um, I mean, just so the readers know, Joey's being... Facetious here. I'm trolling so hard lately. I've, I've been trolling on the two plus two forums lately so hard. Trolling me hard, and I watched the Stinger video yesterday, and you're you totally convinced. You have Brian Hastings convinced that I eat every three minutes. He is a hundred percent convinced. Are you, are you claiming you don't eat every three minutes? Do you remember saying that? I, you do. I thought you did. I think you do. I'm convinced you do. No, I don't. <laughs> he actually was to be right. <laughs> you know what I? You know what I think would be funny of the whole scarf thing is like, because all the all the guys of the series are wearing like, you know, expensive, nice scarves that are like, you know, European and whatever. So I'm gonna be that like hipster poker player. So I, I want to get like, like really in your face, like four dollar, you know, stupid looking scarf or something. I think. Wait, I think are you really gonna wear scar scarves while you play? No. Okay, okay, please. I mean, it could be cool, you know, a nice tank top, maybe a Joe Ingram one uh, podcast tank top, maybe a, a backwards hat, and, and a nice scarf. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a pretty good look. You know, your muscles are protruding out of outside of the scarf, and actually, you know, you know what I like to do um, at live tournaments is I like to play up the whole uh, thing. Like I'll often just say I'm like a football player. Um, you know, I, I played college ball, and I, I like playing poker with my buddies or whatever. And it's great because, like, nobody thinks that I'm a good poker player unless they know who I am. And a lot of people in the live scene don't know who I am, right? So, um, yeah, I, I play that up pretty well, actually, I think. Wow, I that, you're dropping strat here. You, you, you. I used yeah. to tell people to trust, but... As so. someone that plays 97% of my poker online, I've got a few um, live tricks on my sleeve, for sure. 
I, I tend to be very... We don't, we don't, come on, stop giving the secrets away, Sean. We're keeping them the secret. I've got one that I'm just never giving away because it's, like, the best thing ever. So I can't I can't give that away. But I've got a few little tricks. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no pushover in live poker, I think. Yeah, the one tournament I went deep in, the, the one that I finished third, the 5K No Limit, I think it was, like, three years ago now, I had multiple people uh, who ran deep in that tournament um, that final table actually come up to me after and be like, like, who are you? And I, and I just be like, oh, you know, I play online, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, I thought you were just some dumb jock, and I was so confused <laughs> because I was playing you as if you were, like, a fish, and then by the time we had gotten down to, like, you know, final table, they were just like, this guy's actually clearly good and knows what he's doing, so... Like, they were just very confused, so it kind of made me realize I should take advantage of that a little more, maybe. I think it's a great idea. Do you wear do you wear tank tops or, like, a tight shirt to... I would, I would, I would prefer to, but I find the Rio is incredibly cold a lot of the time, the air conditioning in there, so... Um, I don't know, maybe tank top and a toque, maybe that'll work. You could also bring a, a hoodie and, you know, sometimes put it on and when you're feeling a bit warmer and... You know, we're, we're, we're getting into some clothing right now. So, World Series of Poker, when are you heading there? What are your plans? Are you staying with someone? Where are you staying? Uh, I am going to be going June 16th to June 23rd, and I'm going to play the... Uh, there's two PLO events, $1,500 PLO event and a 5K PLO event. I plan on playing those and then celebrating winning both of those tournaments on the weekend at EDC with my buddy Joe Ingram because we're gonna rage out at EDC. Wait, are we are we are we raging together? I mean, is that are we are we making this happen or what? I don't know. I mean, if you're gonna be there, I feel like it's probably a pretty good option. I think. Well, I know I was I've been talking to uh, WCG Doug Doug uh, Doug and he he's going with you know the, his his group of recent heads up uh, heads up World Series of Poker event winner. Jason Moe, can we call him a winner? He got second in the in the event number two, the 25k mix max. But I think he'll be a part of that group. Um, are, are you? Did, have you talked to other people that you're planning on going going there with at all? Um, no, I mean poker players are lazy, right? So I don't think anybody really has a plan. I think I know a lot of people that are going to be going. I don't know uh, if any of them have bought tickets or anything like that. Well, for, let's make this happen. Now, I mean, now, I'm in. I'm maybe my girlfriend. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure my girlfriend will be there with me unless we. Break up. I don't think that's going to happen, but you never know. I'm prepared for anything. I'm sorry, Aaron, if you're watching. It's a long time. You never know what can happen between now and then. You make a good point. We'll be. We're going to be there for sure. Because uh, plus, plus, are you going to play any tournaments? If you win a tournament, you have to upgrade girlfriend. That's like the rule. It's just the way it goes. No. That's the way it works. Bro, bro, listen. You better hope Aaron don't fucking hear that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's like that Seinfeld episode where, like, when. The doctor, the med student, becomes a doctor. He dumps Elaine, and he said it was always his dream of like <laughs> becoming a doctor, so that he could dump whoever he's with and and get somebody better. So yeah. that's the way poker. Actually, don't think there's not many tournaments I could win besides like the the huge ones that it would really make that big make that any sort of difference yeah. as far as how I approach women. But I could see it. There's a scenario if I, if I won like I actually don't know. I'm pretty sure I approach them in the same way, no matter. How much I might win in a tournament? I don't know. So you know, had money, lost money. That's you know, yeah, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Not that. Not that. Uh, not that exciting. I was gonna ask something. Oh, okay. So, so if you play the 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 five K PLO six match, which is on day one of the music fest. Yeah. You're gonna win it on day two, and then go day three. Yeah. Okay. My birthday is right after that. It'll be um, be it's gonna be an exciting couple times. I mean, even if even if uh, I were to like you know go deep, it'll oh, you go there after. Day. So I'll get the one night at EDC at at the very least. But I mean, I've learned not to plan to do well in tournaments. <laughs> like, like you can pretty much you know enter a tournament and make a dinner date, and you're gonna make that dinner like eighty percent of the time. So just assume that you're not gonna do well in tournaments, because the last thing you want to do is be like oh, I'm going to keep my schedule clear because I plan on going deep in all these tournaments, and then you don't do anything fun. You just end up hanging out, like, hanging out of the Rio for six weeks. It's I, funny because every year the same thing happens. Like, I I make, like, a plan. It's been, like, five years since I've done, like, the entire series. And 
every year I make like this loose plan a month before that I'm gonna like go for a week here and then maybe go for a week there or whatever. And every single year when the series rolls around, the first few days there's some sort of excitement, like the 25k event, you know. And it makes me wake up the next day and be like, I'm like a coin flip away from just booking a flight and going, because it seems like there's so much fun, so much stuff going on. I got friends final tabling, like I can be one of those guys. I can win a big tournament. And it's funny because like. You're shaking your head. I don't know. If Please, I know. no, don't do it. Yeah, and that that shows our maturity as poker players. I think that we've we've either done that and regretted it, or we know well enough by now that like not to like fall victim to that. So I, I feel like I've been strong, and I'm not going until June 16th. So good. Yeah, I mean, not the same way. Like when I go, when I'm thinking about going to Vegas for the. World Series, I I'm not even thinking about playing poker at all. People are like, well, yeah. you're going to play poker, right? I'm like, I didn't think about that quite yet. You know, I just want to, I'm excited. I get to see people out there. You know, I get to, all my friends I talk to on Skype or on Facebook and on Twitter, you finally get to, they're all in one place. And, but what I've also found is that there's actually not as much time to see those people, the the grinder. They're, the guys, once they get to the high stakes, they, they stop grinding as much, so they, they actually can do more things. Like, right. But the, the guys that aren't quite at that level yet, that, that are really, you know, poker, poker, poker still, those guys I actually find I don't ever really get to see unless it's a very random, like, hey, I want to get dinner 20 minutes before we get dinner type of thing. So, yeah. yeah they're kind of, like, in jail for the series, right? Because they have their, like, their, their package that they sold at whatever markup, and then they have to, like, play all those tournaments regardless of whether or not they feel like doing something else, they just, like, they're in jail for the summer at the Rio, you know. I was in jail last night. You were what? I was in jail. I call it being in jail when you, like, there are extenuating reasons why you have to play poker. So, like, as a heads-up player, if you're playing a fish and he has a bunch of your money, you just, like, can't stop. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on in real life. There's just no, there's no option. You just can't quit a guy that has tens of thousands of your dollars at the table and is, like, seconds away from giving it all away. So, yeah, I was in jail last night. It sucked. I had to cancel on a few friends. I never do that. I hate having to do that. It's pretty, uh... I mean, I... I'm trying to think. I never really put poker much anymore before... My play. Obviously, it's different in a heads-up setting when you're at high stakes, when you might not get that action for a couple, you know, who knows when you might get that same action, and all right. they're stuck, and you know they're bad. It's it's kind of hard to leave that opportunity. Yep. I try to explain it to my friends, and they kind of they kind of get it. Sometimes I tell them I'm in jail. And they and they know right away, huh? Yeah. It doesn't or, happen that often. Maybe, maybe only a couple times a month, but... Because you don't lose a lot. I mean, what, you know, it's nice when you run well and you never lose. You, you don't have to worry about being in jail and taking back your money. It's not so much that, but, like, first of all, you don't get a lot of fish action to, be, to begin with at higher stakes. And secondly, when you do, they often hit and run anyways. It's not like they're willing to just two or three table you and win a bunch of buy-ins and then be like, okay, well, I'm going to keep playing until you win it back. <laughs> yeah. Where are, you at? Where are you staying at for uh, while you're out there? No one's uh, going to I'm crash with some buddies. Um... I don't know who specifically is in the house. I feel like it's um, my buddy and his brothers. I don't know if you would know them. They're the Greenwoods, Max Greenwood. He actually he lives in my building here in Toronto. Um, really awesome family. There's a lot of cool poker players in Toronto. Um, he was uh, he used to play like cash games back in the day. He used to do really well in the party days, and it's kind of like slowly migrated to MTTs over the years. And he actually won a World Series event back in like '09 or something. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think he's in a house with like I want to say Scott Seaver and like King Dan, and a few guys like that, kind of like that crew. Um, yeah, a lot of that crew hangs out in Toronto a lot. A lot of cool guys. That'd, be, that'd, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think uh, also there's. Um to plug a future guest, I think of, you said you're friends with him, uh, Anski, Donnie Stern, he's going to be uh, on a podcast, on a PLO podcast coming up here. I told him we're going to do one after uh, Izzel Drun, and uh, you're, so you're friends with him, right? Yeah, Donnie's a good friend of mine. Um, yeah, he's a cool guy. He, you guys he, hang out if he's, if he's in Toronto? You guys, do you guys hang out up there? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's kind of like a Toronto poker crew that hangs out like fairly frequently, and, and I, I I do when, when, I, when I can, but it's tough because like just because they're in Toronto for a couple weeks doesn't mean I can, like, 
entertain them. Like, I also I have my friends who live in Toronto all the time, right? And, like, so it's tough for me to just kind of, like, oh, ditch my buddy's birthday party because the poker guys are in town or whatever. So I don't always get to see them as much. But, um, yeah, when they're, they're – uh, when they're in, and plus, when they're in town, they're often here because they're grinding, right? So, um yeah, I don't I don't see them a ton, but I do see them, you know, here and there. Yeah. Um, I think Donnie's in like Mexico now. I think he's been grinding a ton this year, actually. He said he put in. Yeah, he sent a, a thing on Twitter. He's like, "Can I be in the podcast? When am I gonna be on the podcast?" I'm like, "He's like, I played 160 thousand hands. Is that an is that a, is that enough to get me on the podcast like in a joking way?" And I I think that's a lot of fucking hands. That's that's a yeah. pretty good amount of volume. That is. It's actually. Um, I thought it, I thought he played more though because I, I see him play all the time. I just assume like the guys playing Zoom are just rifling off like you know ten thousand hands an hour because uh, it's just like such a fast paced like I don't know. yeah bro. Like, especially when you play heads up and you know you're both playing a lot of hands a lot of hands get to showdown it's just like like I can just three table somebody and play like you know two hundred hands an hour and it's just versus Zoom, where you're just zooming out, like, 400, 500 hands an hour or so. That's not a lot of hands an hour, though, by the way. Well, for PLO... At my peak, I was getting 1,800 I don't hands. want to hear about your peak. 1,800, 1,800 <laughs> hands an hour. Ridiculous. Yeah, it was... It was. I don't know if I'm going to do that again. I hope not. Wow. I, I, I feel like... Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like... The combination of playing that many hands and the rake at like mid mid to low like low to mid stakes would make it like almost like very very difficult to actually be long term profitable for today's games. Like I feel like a few years ago it was different because people were not as good, mm. but now like. A lot of that, too, I assume, is because you're playing, like, fairly tight. There's a lot of folding going on and stuff, and I feel like you can't really get away with that now by making a lot of, like, tightish folds. You kind of just got to, like, try to go after all your equity now to really, you know. You, you smell that, Laforte? What did you do? What did you do? Small profit in the... You just... I thought maybe you, like... You just you mentioned know, some profit, some profiting idea right there. I thought maybe you're just, like, gassy. You had, like, a big breakfast or something. Oh, from reading your suggestions on... You actually didn't give suggestions on breakfast. I, I make bacon and eggs and sausage all the time, and I'm not sure if that's recommended in your in your um, putting on some size. I think it is. Just eat. It's eat a lot. Yeah, it's calories. I mean, um, when making decisions about food and you're trying to gain weight, the answer is just always just eat it. <laughs> like, fucking, just okay. fucking eat it. I'm, because, I'm excited. Because it's that. always going to be the limiting factor, right? Like... I'm not saying to go crazy and eat a lot of bad food because obviously, first of all, it's not going to make you feel good. And if you're not feeling good, it's going to be tough for you to continue training hard every day and things like that. But the the, the point is is that, you know, for for 9.7 out of 10 guys who are failing at trying, trying to put on weight, it's because they're just not eating enough calories. So uh, my general advice without knowing somebody's situation is, yeah, just go ahead and eat it, bro. Fucking eat more. You know, don't be measuring your shit. Just grab three handfuls and put it on and eat it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm pretty excited. I, I feel like I'm at about 185 ish right now, and and hopefully with the Lafort guiding guidance system, yeah, after King Man person, I'll be able to get up to like 195, 200 ish. But I play a lot of basketball. I play seriously. I have played like. Eight hours of basketball multiple times in a day this week yeah. already. So I feel like that's going to definitely impede my progress as far it as will. absolutely it will. Um, when you do exercise like that for extended periods of time, your body tends to be forced into having to break down some muscle, um, and it'll try to repair it. And oftentimes, like you're fine, like or like it'll 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 increase your stamina and your long-term muscle endurance, but uh, it's generally not going to put on... It's, it's generally going to be a bit of a hindrance when it comes to putting on muscle. It's, it's not to say that you can't do it, um, mm -hmm. but you kind of need to go even further overboard with, like, with making sure you're going excess calories and stuff, because you're, you're probably burning, you know, 
I don't even know, like maybe a thousand calories over those like five hours of basketball or something. One thing you suggested to me that I started doing was eat a eat something or a protein bar, or protein shake or something during my workout because yeah. when my when my basketball workout goes so long, yeah, I should try that and that's what I've started doing. I've noticed a lot more energy going to that. Oh yeah, my workout. Is that give your body um some short term energy sources as opposed to being like like fuck I have no calories and you know you're putting me through this absolute crazy rigorous five hour workout I got to start breaking down muscles so that I have energy um, by getting a little bit of food into you it, it can go a long way for sure so um, let's uh, I'm gonna call this a PLO podcast we haven't talked any hands but I'll, I'm gonna do another podcast for people listening that are listening to this like right away I'm gonna do another one this will very soon within the next hopefully a few days and we will we will get into some hands I'm also going to start breaking down the podcast. I'm going to keep the unedited live streams up, but I'm going to break down the podcast with all the hands that we discussed and a couple highlights. That way people that just want to see the hands or they're very interested in the hands, they might not have time to watch three hours, two hour live stream. They'll be able to just see the hand parts. So I'm going to start doing that and you know, hopefully people will, will like that. We'll take some questions from some live streamers some people watching. Uh, Tan, Tan, Tanda, Tanda, it's a dumb name. Sorry, I got Tanda. Tanta, I'm gonna call it Tanta and think it's a foreign, like jeans, like the big. We, oh, we didn't even talk about that. I'll talk about that next time. We'll go talk about the jeans discussion and that thing next right. time. But uh, he says, Yo, Joe, I got a question about Zoom PLO. Up to like one two, everyone plays sensible. Then two five, two point five slash five. The average pot is like thirty five percent of the buy-in. Why the fuck does everybody go nuts in the higher stakes? I think you find that just because people are better players uh, in general, therefore they, they feel like they can play more aggressive in a lot more situations, and that's probably why you find those those games come across as nuts, per se. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I think um, the nature of the game of PLO has um, equities running much closer. So there's a lot more battling, and there's a lot more getting to showdown, which is going to be a lot bigger average pots. And I think the lower stakes you go, you probably have more people um, just taking the less variance route, folding a bit more in a lot of yeah, and, and and even just like simply making those mistakes and just like folding spots that they shouldn't fold, or um, you know, or or maybe even playing a little too fit or fold, maybe raising spots where they should be calling and getting to showdown. So instead, they raise and the pot is over. Or um, oh. yeah. Okay, chill, chill. Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm sick. We got to take the live stream. Take that last part you just set up. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Okay. So Napsis Johan says, "Find what you love and let it kill you." I think he was referring to um, drugs. <laughs> was he? I don't think he was. <laughs> Pretty sure. Girl? I know Johan was not referring to drugs when he said that. I think we were talking about. Um, I can't remember what we were talking about. He, he said it was 22 minutes ago. I can't remember, but he's going to listen to us tomorrow. He's a, definitely a friend of the podcast. Uh, George Turner, what's up, guys? LaFort, what was the deciding factor for me to switch from No Limit to PLO? That's a really good question. Um, I think I started dabbling in PLO maybe three years ago, three or four years ago. I had like a month or two where I kind of made it a an interesting challenge to take it on and... and um, basically monitor its profitability versus continue, continuing with Hold'em. So I basically ran some numbers for like a lost opportunity cost for missing out on a month or two of Hold'em and what my expected you know earnings would be over that time and was kind of looking at it as paying tuition for learning PLO because it might be a better opportunity because it's clear that there's been a lot of players in the past that have progressed over to PLO and another indication at the time was that guys were just simply getting really, really good at hold'em. I mean, like, I was getting to the point where I couldn't even really sit 10-20 and play most of the regs and feel good about it. So I was like, maybe if I want to continue to play higher stakes, I might need to consider playing a new game. So um, the first time I gave PLO a crack at it, I kind of, I think I ran really bad and um, was very frustrated because I think I was focusing on the wrong things. Um, and kind of, like, ran away with my tail between my legs back to hold them. And then um, at that point over the next year, I just kind of, like, 
slowly was talking to different people um, about PLO and just and even like the mixed games I considered learning them. Um, but the problem with learning the mixed games is like you either play for hundreds of thousands of dollars in these big games that run, mm-hmm. or you just don't play them at all because there's no other games that run. So it's like there's no um, in in the in the learning curve. There's not going to be any money made until you're playing those games. With PLO, it's different. You can be a two four regular and bang out you know ten k months, and that's like offsetting the money you could be losing by not playing Hold'em, or you could be winning from playing Hold'em. So that was probably my biggest thing with PLO. I was like, you know what? I don't think it'll take that long before I reach that threshold where PLO is as profitable as Hold'em is. Um, and I also feel as though, you know, Hold'em's not getting any better, it's definitely getting worse, and it's it's potentially true that I could get really good at PLO and it could be a lot more profitable at Hold'em. And I guess you could say that I was just kind of, I took that gamble and got lucky that I was able to kind of like, you know, figure things out at, at a good pace. Um, there was a time where I was trying to juggle both, play both, um, you know, heads up PLO, heads up Hold'em, mm-hmm. and it didn't take long before I realized that like, you had to quit one or the other, probably. Opportunity in PLO. Like, people are so much worse. There's so much more room for edges. And it didn't take long before I just, like, was like, you know, there's no need to be playing Hold'em at all. So Yeah, you uh, decided to give it a give it a shot full-time, and that was, like, said four years ago, and now we're here. You're... Well, actually, I mean, that was more like two years ago. Two years ago, okay. So you kind of juggled it back and forth for a couple years then. Yeah, um, well, like I said, that first stint, was like a month or two, and I just it was a fail. And then I was like, you know, screw this, I'm going back to Hold'em. And then I just played Hold'em for like another year. And then it was probably um, like two, yeah, probably even less than two years, maybe a year and a half ago when I like really got serious to be full-time PLO-ish. I'm looking yeah. at a couple more comments here. We're, we're mm-hmm. at about 52 minutes. We'll, we'll wrap it up here in about uh, seven minutes, seven or eight minutes here. So one person said the cologne you might be referring to is John Paul... Yes, that's it. Is that it? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, I'll check that out. I've never heard of that. Wait, I don't check it out. Everyone has it, right? Don't. It's a really good smell. Like, you'll enjoy it, mm-hmm. but everybody has it. So my advice is to wear it when you're, like, going to play basketball because you just want to smell it because you enjoy the smell, Wait, but you know, not you wear it when you're going on a date to try to impress the girl. You wear cologne when you play basketball? Well, I'm just saying, in a scenario you where you... Play basketball? I, I I will throw on cologne if um, if I'm going into a like a sports setting just because it masks the smell of my stinky gym clothes. We gonna play some ball together? Uh, <laughs> basketball is like I feel like I'm pretty good at most sports, and basketball is well, not one, huh? I grew up in a small town in Canada where there's hockey. Maybe a little bit of football because there's a lot of a lot of like big, strong, young, you know, footballish type dudes, you know, farmer dudes. Um, some rugby, a uh, little bit of like baseball, a little bit of soccer, and like no basketball. Like it's just not like a, a tiny amount, I guess. I have a few friends that were like good. Um, so yeah, so I wasn't really exposed to it a whole lot, but. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty like athletic, so I might just try to like get physical. <laughs> Go, man, let's play. Like if we play street rules, I might be all right. But if there's like somebody you know, calling fouls, I might try to just like go after one of your knees or something. Like I'm, I might be able to figure something out. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm scared now. I go, I take that back. I'm whatever. What? Well, we'll, eh, we'll talk about that later. So okay. During um, we're so we're gonna be together during EDC at some point in time. We'll we'll do some video stuff while we're out there. We'll do some like live video blog while that we're there. Fun. I'm gonna do, super fun. I know. I'm excited. I'm gonna try to do a lot of videos while because like no one really puts out any videos like even behind the scenes. Like what are you up to? Who are you hanging out with? So I'm gonna put out some content for people to watch. Do some live podcasts. Just try to do a bunch of fun shit that people can watch and feel like they might be there if they're not there, or just enjoy it. I like that a lot. Especially EDC. Like, there's literally going to be, like, dozens and dozens of people there that we know, and we're, like, I'm going to run into all the time or whatever. And Yeah. Yeah, sure. It'll be one person, one more comment from the live stream, Anthony W. He says, I'm not active on the forum, but sometimes I browse them. That turned me into watching three entire interviews you posted here. Lafort seems like a great guy. I really want to read his blog. 
was the link. Well, I said I'm gonna po I'll put the link in the description for this as well. But go ahead and let's uh, you get, just say the link too. Yeah, it's www.lefortements. Uh, L e f o r t a m e n t s dot wordpress dot com. I think at some point I'll probably try to adopt my own web, like my own, you know, link or whatever. But for now, I wasn't sure if the blog was going to have any popularity, so I just kind of oh. threw it up there. I think another thing too is that if you host it on the WordPress like you're doing, you're going to get some, uh, you know, random traffic that people exactly. might find. They might search. So I actually. Yep. Even if you do adopt your own site, you should still uh, dual post them both, just because people might read, and you might get some feedback or get some comments from people that you would never never have gotten had you kept it on your own unique website. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm kind of hoping is that it gains some notoriety through um, through basically just appreciating the content and then um, uh, you know, offering it to other friends and stuff, and and like, because it tends to be like it's 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 obviously very extensive and 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 technical. So it's kind of like I want it something that people can kind of go back to and be like, oh, I wonder what Lafort said on this, or I wonder what his 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 opinion is on this. So it's kind of covering a lot of stuff. Well, I just thought of an idea that I think you might you might be thinking this already though. So essentially, you have what you've written your three your three main articles as your as your top, so let's say we break it down from like a, a top part. So those are your top parts right there. Those are your base articles that are already done. Yeah. And I think you expand on this. Then you break that uh, that main article down into 10, 15, 20, 30, however many topics where you can then either field a question where somebody wants to know more about, or you can just break them down yeah. you know, one or two at a time. Then someone might read that one or two at a time, become interested. They read that too. It's really easy to read for them. Yeah. Then they become interested. You're like, this is this is a part of a bigger series. You know, right. this is like the bracket or you know, however timeline, something like that type of thing. That might yeah. be a good idea too, because then you're always putting out new content for people to read. If right. someone right. might read one thing, not be interested, they read another thing, then they're like, oh wait, all right, I'm gonna go read these things again because I understand what he's talking about here. So that might be a, an idea to consider as well. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, basically how I want to approach it in the future. I think, but now that I've done the the, the groundwork for the the basics and fundamentals, it's it's nice to just kind of have that there, and people yeah, can exactly. you know, if they want to spend forty five minutes reading it, they can. Um, if they don't, if they want to wait for the shorter articles, that's fine too. Yeah, um, my little brother's in the chat. My little brother enjoys watching my YouTube stuff. He's four, fourteen years old. He always comments on my stuff. He says, "Bro," I'd like to say hello to my little bro. I hope you're having fun today. I hope you're uh, getting ready for a date later tonight, potentially. Even though I know he's not getting ready for a date later tonight. But I'd like him to be getting it'd be fun if he was, you know, fun for him. Yeah. My, my cousin's watching people about his cologne game today. His cologne game is 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 non existent. That's right. Well you gotta work you gotta start somewhere. I was thinking about doing some YouTube videos with him where we like I like teach him things. <laughs> we like, like talk things? Back. what? Like life things? Yeah, like life things. Yeah, I just teach him. Like we like he like learns at something and we like record it and uh, we put it up. I like that. It'd be fun. My cousin Christina is also watching. She says, um, "I hope you don't win anything." Referring to me wanting to upgrade my girlfriend um, as the idea oh. that you. Would... Yeah. I feel like I shouldn't have said that. I feel bad now. I feel. I mean, it was it was said in jest towards like. Hey, don't backtrack now, kid. Own up your statement. You know, you said. You upgrade a girlfriend when you win. Okay, you know that's the advice you want to give to the listeners. That's fine, buddy. That's okay. What are we at? We're at 58 minutes. All right, let's get this done before I one hour. Lafort, thank you for joining me. I'm sorry, guys, that we we talked some PLO, but yeah, there's enough in there. There's enough in there to call it a PLO podcast. I think. I I totally agree. I wanted to show this interesting Cole Southham that he tweeted about, but we don't have enough time for that today. So. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> that's fun, fucking funny. And, uh, that's an interesting hand. But all right, so let's just look at it. It's just gonna take a couple minutes. Let's just do a brief right. look. Sure. Let's 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 include a bonus hand here. So I actually have it up right here. Let me uh, pull it up. Here we go. And um, now I can I figure out a way to do this where it stays up even if you talk. All right. So this hand. Let me zoom in. So this is a hand that um, a very long time high stakes player Cole South, aka CTS, aka uh, runs like God, aka never loses money. AKA, I don't know, whatever. That's what that's what I'll call him for right now. He posted on his Twitter this interesting hand he played. 
And I looked at the hand, and obviously I think it's kind of interesting. So yeah. he is... You know what's funny is, like, I thought at first this hand was against me because we played a bunch yesterday, um, but it wasn't. But, yeah, because I wouldn't make that play. But it, I it, Yeah, I feel like you'd remember this hand as well, by the way. Right, yeah. I don't remember hands, but, yeah, continue. You remember this hand, I think. So uh, so the hand is Cole. There are 200 big blinds deep at 25.50. Uh, small blind, unknown, raises. Cole, three bets with King, Jack, 10-8 with um, hearts. And now the flop comes Ace, 9-7 with Ace, 9 of clubs. So Cole flops a wrap and uh, no backdoor flush draw. Just a wrap. He decides to check instead of continuation bet here. Mm -hmm. And the villain checks back. And the turn is where the hand gets super interesting. So the turn to three of clubs, it brings the flush. So it's ace, nine, seven, three with three clubs. And Cole has eight, ten, jack, king. So he still has a wrap. He decides to pot the turn. They're 200 big lines deep. The, yeah. villain, the villain in the hand, three X's it to 2,700. So 900, 2,700. Cole clicks it back to 4,500. And then the villain calls... The river is the jack of clubs, so it's ace, nine, jack, seven, three, and Cole has the nut straight, but also obviously the flush is out there. He checks, the villain goes all in, and Cole calls it the straight, and the villain ends up showing up with king, king, nine, three, with the king of clubs blocker, and played an extremely, extremely weird hand he played. So what are your thoughts on this hand, Sean? What's going on here? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I think it's notable. It's also notable to say that uh, to point out that, that Cole also does not have any club blockers. Oh, okay, that's true. That is makes his river call even more a little more miraculous. Um, I don't know if miraculous is the, the right word, but I think um, flop is. I mean, pre flop is like whatever. Um, flop is. I think it's probably the same way I play it. I assume he was planning to check call. Um, you know, there's obviously merits to betting as well, but I think, I think whatever, it's fine. And then turn he pots, which is like, you know, like the other guy basically is never going to have the nut flush, or very, 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 very infrequently. I mean, to be 200 big blinds deep and check back the nut flush draw, regardless of what else you have in your hand on this flop, would just be like a really bad play. So, um... You know, so pot, potting the turn there, I think, is fine. Um, he's got to get a bunch, bunch of hands to fold out. The guys um, that are that obviously he's he's losing to, um, and then you know a bunch of the hands that might call, like two pairs and whatnot. He has outs against, um, and he's applying max pressure on a range that, in theory, is capped because it's completely possible too that Cole is looking to check raise. Um, you know, king king ten eight with clubs on the flop, you know stuff like that. So like, he can definitely have the nuts here. Um, now when the other guy uh, raises, it it is a little transparent because, like I said, um, it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for him to have the nut flush. I mean, you'd have to make a fairly unorthodox play on the flop, and I don't really see him wanting to raise anything worse than the nut flush, because like I said, Cole can certainly have the nut flush. So the only thing that really makes sense is a blocker. And I guess Cole thought the same, because obviously he re-raised. And the thing is, is like, what sucks about Cole is like, in this spot, it's like, okay, I'm pretty sure the other guy's bluffing, but he also has the best hand. So I can't really just call and win that way. Um... So Cole clicks it back, hoping the guy just folds his, you know, blocker or stupid other, like he might just have whatever, like some other hand uh, as a bluff. And then the guy calls, and then Cole checks the river when he gets there, which I assume Cole planned on um, bluffing the river uh, if he didn't get there, I think. Maybe not, though, but anyways... He gets there on the river to make the straight and check calls um, with the same uh, understanding, I assume, that he thinks the other guy is basically just going to have the king walker here a lot and not have the nut flush a lot because he checked back the flop. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I think Cole's line is interesting. What's funny about the the other guy's hand is like he had two pair on the turn, hmm. and I don't know if he wasn't aware or not, but he's allowed to just click call <laughs> and see what happens on the river. Um, just because you have, I feel like this is a very common mistake by a lot of PLO players is when they have the nut flush blocker, they feel compelled that they just have to turn it into a bluff or be bluffing in some part, even though it doesn't fit well into their general strategy and or their general range and or sometimes their general hand like this one where it's actually a good bluff catcher. Um, so yeah, I mean, like let's just say opponent calls the turn um, you know, Cole gets there on the river, but, like, obviously the opponent's going to have a lot of flushes. Like, Cole might even check fold that river. Um, and he can just turn his two pair into a bluff. So, like, or check down and win a bunch. So, like, it's a, it's a lot of chips going into the pot that unnecessarily went into the pot, in my opinion. But, yeah, fun hand, I guess. Well, now they're going to... Now they're going to... Now they're gonna ask me. They want. They're gonna want more strategy now that you said. Now that you went through that answer. Thank you. Sorry. As people, <laughs> yeah, as people said that they're like, oh yeah, more strategy. Like yeah, let Lafort go in the strategy more. I was like, well, obviously they want. Like of course you want to hear Lef the, one of the best heads up people players debatably in the world go into more strategy. You wouldn't want to hear it. Who, who if he, I'll, I'll listen to you talk for. 45 hours straight if you're going to tell, tell me how to get better at poker, obviously, you know what I mean, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind, like, picking apart a hand like this that's kind of unique and talking yeah. a little bit about it, because, um... <laughs> it's get ready for this, bro. This is what you're going to be looking at soon. I love that when you put on this beard hood, you also put on this face of, like, seriousness, too, as if, like... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't take it seriously. But anyway... Um, <laughs> The cool thing about being able to pick apart these hands a little bit is that I feel all right about it because I'm giving away maybe some thought process of, like, my hand reading abilities, but not so much um, general strategy stuff, which is... Yeah, how, how to play type of thing. Yeah, like, I don't want to be giving away, like, you know, my flop check raising frequencies and, like, stuff like that, which you would talk about more if I was making a video or something. So um, I don't mind picking apart a hand like that every once in a while and... Uh, giving the viewers some entertainment and maybe some food for thought. Giving the viewers something to learn and make them better at poker. We, <laughs> we put that hand out and we lost like 10 viewers on the live stream. Fuck's sake. Or, I'm sorry, guys. We right. No more poker strategy then. They, like, they don't want to see like, a hand came out there. Like, my cousin like, clicks out. My little bro's like, fuck this shit. I'm out of here. You know? And uh, Let's wrap it up. All right, so that's okay. it, Sean. Thanks for joining me on, on this episode, another episode. Um, I'm guessing we might not be back sometime sooner than later because I think we both enjoy uh, doing this, which is it's fun, whether it's not fun. And, Maybe um, we can do a uh, World Series recap one after uh, after I get back or whatever at some yeah, point. Yeah, that would be, be very exciting. You can tell us a bit of your time out there and how you did. And, cool beans. Uh, some uh, interactions you might see with people out there, and uh, yeah, if, um, yeah, be sure to check out the other people podcast. Like I said, I just did one with uh, Ryan Hastings, and we have coming up with Dizzle Droon and with uh, Ansky, and those will hopefully be up in the next couple weeks. And uh, follow me on Twitter at Joanger One. Follow the Fort at Lafortements, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't have any script or notes taken for this one, so I'm not sure what else to say right now. That's all I got. All right, um, over and out. Bye, everyone. Hey, enjoy your pool party today, man. Enjoy, enjoy, have fun. I look forward to it. Yeah, gonna get my tan on. And embrace the embrace the shirtlessness, my friend. All right. So, so I'll talk to you soon. Later, buddy. All right, take care.